Please help me give a warm welcome to the one and only Dr. William Fagey. <laughs> Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Joel. And if I have problems moving it around, it's because my lesser trochanter separated from my femur a few weeks ago. And so that's the problem. 62 years ago, I first walked through those doors outside. And I tell you, I was scared. I was there for my interview to see if I could get into medical school. And where you see in the lobby, the wooden wall, that was all glass at that time with two glass doors, and that led into the dean's office and a series of rooms where people were being interviewed. And I remember being so frightened that I would interview the people leaving. What did they ask you? <laughs> and the first person said, they asked me to name three contemporary philosophers and to discuss their philosophies. And you know, I just froze. <laughs> so I went in, and I would not be here today if it had not been for the first interviewer. He asked me, why do you want to go to medical school? Well, you expect that question, so you're ready for it. And I hesitated just a millisecond, and he said, I'll tell you why you want to go to medical school. <laughs> so I've always assumed he was a surgeon. But he gave an answer that was so much better than anything I had planned that I used it with every interviewer after that. And that's why I'm here today. <laughs> so I'd like to say a little bit about this school, say a little bit about global health, uh, maybe a story or two from the book, and then open it up to questions. In the early 1930s, Rockefeller Foundation was uh, improving its medical school in Beirut, Lebanon. And they, re they hired a man by the name of Edward Turner, who had just graduated from the University of Chicago in physiology. He was to head up physiology in Beirut. He went there and he quickly found that he was just inadequate. And so he told the Rockefeller Foundation, I can't do this. So do you know what they said? Well, why don't we send you to medical school? So he went to the University of Pennsylvania, graduated from medical school, went back to Beirut as head of uh, medicine, and he did so well that in 1936, as he was coming back from Beirut, the Rockefeller Foundation actually sent a man to the ship, hoping to hire him before someone else would hire him. And they asked him if he would be willing to go to Meharry University in Nashville, a, an African-American university, and be head of, the, of medicine there. He was so successful, two years later, he was made president of Meharry. After being president for some years, he decided to go into practice. He left Meharry. He immediately got job offers to be dean of medical schools around the country. He ignored them all except one that came from Seattle. And it said he would have a free hand to start a medical school. He came here in September of 1945, was interviewed, immediately said yes, and three years later this building was built. He took over one hole of the golf course, and you have to be politically adept to take over part of a golf course. <laughs> And so this was the first building that we're sitting in, the first building of the School of, of Public Health. I then benefited from the Rockefeller Foundation by being able to come here to school nine years after this uh, building had been uh, completed. And one of the doctors influential in getting this medical school started was the man, a man by the name of Dr. Alfred Strauss. He was a surgeon. He went to medical school in Chicago, but he had graduated from the University of Washington, and he helped get this started. Now, how many of you have read a book, The Boys in the Boat? Ah, okay, quite a few of you. So you remember when the 1936 Olympic team was on the way to Germany, they stopped in Chicago, 
and someone hosted them to stay overnight and provided food for them. That was Dr. Alfred Strauss. And the university now has a Strauss lecture in surgery every year commemorating this man. He happened to grow up part-time in Colville, Washington, where his brother remained, uh, Louis Strauss, and started Barman's, uh, drug store, or Barman's store, department store in uh, Colville. So these are stories from the history of the University of Washington that you may or may not have heard. But then they started recruiting people, and you know, people came here and they so much liked Seattle and the small town atmosphere and the few vehicles on the road <laughs> that it was easy to keep the best teachers. And so the University of Washington very quickly developed a reputation, an amazing faculty. 60 years ago, I was going to medical school here and I could not find two people on the faculty interested in global health. But I did find one, and his name was Ray Ravenholt. He taught here, but he was also the epidemiologist for Seattle King County. And I started working for him after school and on Saturdays. He was a globalist himself, and he later became head of family planning for USAID. But he told me, if you're really interested in global health, there is no good avenue. But the best one would be go to CDC and become part of the Epidemic Intelligence Service. He said, you'll meet people interested in global health, you make lifetime connections, and that's exactly what I did. 60 years later, he's retired here in Seattle, lives in Laurelhurst, he's 93 years old, and on Tuesday, I had a chance to talk before the annual meeting of the Gates Foundation. When I was there, we could put the entire global health group around a table. Now there are 1,500 employees. I was telling them about how important mentors are. And I said, he's not only 93 years old living in Seattle, he's in this room. And he stood up and got an ovation that went on for minutes. So it's important to find mentors and then to be a mentor yourself. The classic first lecture in medical school is 50% of what we teach you over the next four years will be wrong, but we don't know which 50%. <laughs> some of the things that I do remember that bring back some bad memories, we heard do no harm over and over and over. So it became part of us. And it was only after I left medical school that I realized every example that was given turned out to be an error of commission. No one ever talked about errors of omission. And we kill far more people because of the science we don't use, the science we don't share, the fact that we do not get other countries involved with what we know. We kill far more people. So do no harm should be seen as errors of commission and omission. The Institute of Medicine put out a whole publication on this and it's on errors of commission. So keep that in mind, thinking of what it is that's not being done. And the other thing I think about is the lack of diversity. I mean, we, all white males except for three females in the class. I mean, think of that. And as Warren Buffett said the other day, that would be like saying, we won't let anyone whose last name starts between A and L into the Gates Foundation. It's so arbitrary that we have to figure out how it is that we get to, to have a correct view of gender. And gender bias and poverty are the two biggest issues that bother me at the current time. In one aspect, civilization is simply the act of civility. And I mention this because I think one of the most civilized teachers I had at the University of Washington was a man by the name of Clem Finch. He was a hematologist. He was known as a being a little bit odd because he would appear every day on a motor scooter wearing yellow uh, garb in order to protect himself from the rain. But that man was a real civilized man. And I think of him when I think of what does it take to be civilized. 
there was a fellow, I, one story. There was a fellow in our class by the name of Jim Dolan who became a dean of a medical school. And he would keep a tally on people who did things wrong in the class. So he had this list of everybody in the class. You'd get a demerit if you fell asleep, for instance. Five demerits if you killed your dog in physiology, and th that sort of thing. But one day, we had a teacher by the name of Bullweiler giving a lecture in the amphitheater, and one of the students sitting on the aisle fell asleep, and he had his chin on his elbow when it slipped off, the arm went up, his books fell off, and this poor guy fell out of his seat and rolled down the steps. <laughs> and I can remember Jim Dolan, it's it just absolute quiet, and Jim Dolan standing up and saying, 25 points. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't a lot of interest in global health, as I mentioned. Then the Gates Foundation came along, and I mentioned the other day that when the history of global health is written, we're going to see that the tipping point was about the year 2000 and it was due to the Gates family. It changed everything. The fact that they can say that all lives are of equal value, it's easy to say, but they in fact try to live that. What they've done for global health, where in 20 years it went from the backwater, now, I don't know if the University of Michigan, you knew Ken Casey, but he was a classmate of mine. He came back for the 50th anniversary and he said, you won't remember this. But he said, when we were students and having lunch one day, I asked you what you were interested in and you said global health. And he said, I didn't say anything. But inside I said to myself, what a waste. And he said, now I want to say I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> so then with the Gates Foundation, we will see that the tipping point was the Gates family, and they've made avenues now for global health, that there's research in global health. The university has gotten very much into global health, and I was telling the story earlier today of making rounds in the pediatric department at the University of Nairobi and hearing a, pedi a Kenyan pediatrician asking someone else, how did the Huskies do last night? And I turned around, what's going on here? They were from the University of Washington. They'd taken their training here. And so the influence of people here has gone ar around the, uh, the world. I want to tell one other uh, short story. There is a scholarship fund here for people in global health called the Tommy Francis Fund. And this was a gift that started at the University of Michigan. It was in April of 1955 that there was a press conference at the University of Michigan saying that the Salk vaccine actually protected children. And a man by the name of Tommy Francis had done the field trial. He was a virologist and he turned out to be a mentor to Jonas Salk. Jonas Salk did not think a field trial was needed. His approach was, I know the vaccine's good, therefore it would be immoral to have a placebo group. And Tommy Francis said, that's not the way science works. And so Tommy Francis did the field trial. 1.8 million children, hundreds of thousands of medical people, hundreds of thousands of educators. And in less than two years time, he was able to come up with a solution to the, pro to the question, does the vaccine protect? And so he gave that press conference, and this was before cell phones, and he came out and he said in four words that it was potent, safe, and effective. Suddenly, journalists were scrambling to get out of the room to find a uh, phone, and these were people like Fred Friendly and uh, uh, big names of the day. 50 years later, I was invited back to the same lectern to give a talk, and they said I could direct $50,000 to any charity that I wanted. And I thought, you know, Tommy Francis should be remembered for what he did. And so I started the Tommy Francis Fund here at the University of Washington. Not my money, it's the University of Michigan's money, but <laughs> I was able to get foundations to match those funds. And so it's now up about a million dollars because of those matching funds to remember Tommy Francis. 
Tommy Francis' daughter was a bench scientist who became an Episcopal minister, and she's retired here in Seattle. His son-in-law was Russ Alexander, who used to teach here at the University of Washington. So it all comes together nicely into a good story. At the uh, meeting the other day at the Gates Foundation, I told the story about my granddaughter, Ella, who is with us today, who, as we were doing homework a couple months ago, suddenly surprised me by asking, could I ask you a question? And I said, sure. She said, if you died this week, and that got my attention immediately, <laughs> She said, if you died this week, what's the advice you would have wished you had given me? That is a nice question. And so when I was in front of 1,500 Gates Foundation employees, that's the question I had asked. If I would die this week, what's the advice I wish I would have given you before I left? Well, I came up with 10 things, and I'll go through them very quickly. One, be mindful. I said the difference between working for the Gates Foundation and being a beneficiary of the programs is very small. And it's by and large chance, because I statistically should have been born in a village in Africa or India or China. It's largely by chance. Therefore, have respect for the people that are trying to get your advice or your resources. Number two, beware of certainty. Richard Feynman, the physicist, said, certainty is the Achilles heel of science and of religion and of almost anything you can think of, including foundations. And he made the point by saying he was shaving one day when it suddenly struck him that the certainty of physicists in explaining why left and right are reversed in the mirror could not possibly be true or top and bottom would be reversed. And it forced him to start over and try to figure out what is actually going on here. So beware of certainty. And I remember back in school having a periodic table up on the wall, and it was so certain. Molecular weight of hydrogen is one. The molecular weight of oxygen is 16. If you look at a recent one, it says the molecular weight of hydrogen is 1.0093 plus or minus, and of oxygen, 15.999 plus or minus. So even with physics, it's not certain. So beware of certainty. And then I tell them, number three, that if they go into public health or global health or into teaching or into mental health, uh, in the social work, they're not likely to get rich, and they're not likely to ever be thanked. But I say, if you can get around those two things, you are likely to get satisfaction. And I tell them about Pearl Kendrick, who worked at the Michigan Health Department in the 1930s and developed the vaccine for pertussis. And when she died, the dean at the School of Public Health at Michigan who, whose name is Dick Remington, and Joel just gave the Remington lecture recently. Dick Remington wrote, there are hundreds of thousands of people alive in this country enjoying life and work and family because of Pearl Kendrick. He said, could you name one? He said, I can't either. But she was secure in the knowledge of what she had done and did not require thanks. And then I said, number four, find mentors and be a mentor. Number five, think globally, because every place on earth is both local and global. So it doesn't actually matter what you're doing, you're doing global work. And it's not just a geographic term. The late professor at Yale, Pelligan, said that you can trace good scholarship to where people got their training, who their mentors were, what they studied, but he said, great scholarship is found by how much people know outside their field. So think globally about information and uh, geography. Think long-term. We, we need five-year and 10-year plans, and we need a to-do list for today, but think centuries ahead. What difference does it make what you're doing? My wife used to teach preschool, and I would go once a year and 
with a stethoscope and a white coat and x-rays and we talk about health. And one year, a four-year-old girl asked me, do doctors have bosses? Now think about it, it can't be an accidental question. And you wonder what was going on in her head. But I told her, yes, they do. They're, they're good ones, the patients are their bosses. And then a few weeks later, I was giving a seminar at UNICEF and I asked them the question, who are your bosses? And they said, all the children of the world. And I said, that's true, but the real answer is all the children of the world plus every child who will ever be born in the future. And if you're thinking that way, you'll make the right decisions because all those millions of children being born in the future have given you their proxy. And they're dependent on you for what kind of a world you prepare for them. And then, think big. There's a field of study now called the science of scarcity. And what it says is that you start thinking differently if you're deprived of things, whether it's food or water or sex or power or resources. And we were talking about homelessness at lunch today. And these people are thinking differently. And from the outside, we say, well, why don't they do this or that? Why don't they vote? Why don't they? They can't. And what a professor at Harvard says is, if you give me a rich person, allow me to make them poor in one month, they will be thinking poor. And so from the outside, we have to find other ways to motivate them. I was in Albuquerque a few years ago, and they were showing me the voting rates by census tract. And of course, the voting rates were lowest for the poorest census tracts. And they cannot figure out how to get those people to vote. And I said, there's one thing you can predict about poor people, and that is that they play the lottery. And they play the lottery because it's the only way out they can see. So I said, if you gave me your 10 poorest census tracts and allowed me to set up a lottery so that as they left the voting booth, they got a ticket and half of the ticket they kept, half the ticket went into a hat, and the next day there's a drawing. And the drawing would be things they really need, $200 worth of groceries a week from Walmart, $1,000 worth of clothes from Target, that sort of thing. I said, with those 10 census tracts, we would make the case so that the next voting cycle, we could get big money from foundations to prove this, and I said, by the third voting cycle, you wouldn't have to do anything. Politicians would be courting poor people because we would change the way they think. We would change their ability to think in a different way. I said 50 years ago, if you were in global health, you couldn't think big. We thought like poor people. We had such low budgets and we were always trying to figure out how to get the most out of this, but we couldn't think big. We couldn't ask ourselves, what's the real answer to this problem? What would it take in resources? Now, how do we get the resources? We didn't think that way. We thought the other direction. This is what we have. How can we best use it? And improve on history. And I gave just a short example that I was asked once to speak before the uh, Board of Trustees at Emory University on what do I hope my children get out of college? And the night before I was reading Kipling and Kipling is able to take big ideas and put them into a short sentence. And when he's right, he's very right. And when he's wrong, he's irritating. <laughs> and I read that night, the talk slid north and the talk slid south. Through the sliding puffs of the hook of mouth, four things greater than all things are women and horses and power and war. And I knew that was not right. And so I had the audacity to try to rewrite Kipling that night, and the talk slid east, and the talk slid west. And a student asked, what life is best? Four things value all else above, purpose and faith and wisdom and love. And then I ended with number 10, find your way home. One sentence from the book Cutting for Stone Home is not where you are from. Home is where you are needed. And I hoped everyone would find their way home. So finally, 
Many people seem to be discouraged about global health and they often say, it's just pouring money down a rat hole. Nothing ever changes. I want to tell you things have changed so much in global health in just two decades, so much. Not only do we not have smallpox, but when I started in global health, measles was the single biggest lethal agent in the world. There were things like pneumonia or diarrhea that killed more people, but they were a mixture of agents. But measles virus alone was killing over 3 million children a year. That figure went down to 2 million, 1 million, it's down to about 100,000, it's still too high, but the progress has been so dramatic. When I started, 50,000 children a day under the age of five were dying. Now it's down to 15,000. Again, still too high, but real progress has been made. Blindness in Africa has gone down because of Merck giving mectazan for the treatment of onchocerciasis. There are so many statistics that show poverty is being reduced, health is being improved, and there's still a long ways to go. So you won't run out of of, uh, of things to do if you're interested in global health. Last point, a couple of ideas on, uh, from my book. It's a book about CDC and just stories from CDC. It's not a history of CDC or public health, just some stories that I like. I tell some stories about politics and politicians that really help public health because every public health decision ultimately rests on a political decision. And I used to become so upset about political decisions that were not good for public health. And one day I went into work so angry about a political decision, and my deputy, Bill Watson, said, well, it's all your fault. And I said, what? And he said, if you had anticipated what they needed to know before they made that decision, you could have changed the outcome. And so I went to this phase in my evolution of trying to figure out how do you anticipate what politicians need? There's such a turnover of politicians that that is really labor intensive. So I finally went to the third area of my evolution, which I'm now appealing to you. Some of you should go into politics. This is the most efficient way to get things changed. People who have the right ideas, who get into politics, and can influence the other people in politics. Some of you should be thinking about doing that. There are some stories in the book about ethics, and one of them that continues to beguile me is years ago there was a problem with liquid protein diet. None of you will remember this, but there were a number, a couple dozen women who died using liquid protein as their diet. And we investigated this and we found that you could trace this to some neurological cardiac defects and so this was taken off the market. But then the Casey committee, Casey, Senator Casey committee, asked me for the names of the women who had died. And my immediate reaction was, no, you can't have those names. I mean, this is privacy. We told the families we would not share this information. Only to find out from legal counsel at CDC, I didn't have a leg to stand on. Because people lose their privacy when they die. And number two, Congress had excluded itself from the Privacy Act. And so they said, for two reasons, I had to turn over those names. So I called the the people back in Washington, and I said, are you willing to issue a subpoena for the names? And they said, of course. And I said, okay. Uh, and they said, then you'll give us the names? I said, no. I said, the next step after that will be you take me to court, and then I lose. <coughs> they said, if you know you're going to lose, why would you do that? I said, I want people to know I did everything I could to protect their privacy, and Congress is the one that would not allow them to have privacy. And with that, they backed off and decided it wasn't worth the effort. Ethics is such a difficult subject in public health because in medicine, if someone comes up with a new idea, you really have to prove that a second time with a second group before it's accepted. In public health, you sometimes have to make a decision and never have a chance to go back to, to do it again. 
And this happened with um, toxic shock syndrome. Once we realized that rely tampons were the problem here, they were taken off the market and we have no chance to then go back and see if this is true or not. So you have to be so careful in the ethical approach in public health. The uh, last thing, one chapter that I did not put in the book and I just regret it. And that's the story of cholera. Because there was a man by the name, he's still alive, he's 92 or 93, Gene Gangarosa, and he believed that cholera was worth studying because it was such a big problem, but he wasn't sure that we had the science right. At that time, we thought that cholera actually denuded the intestinal coating so that it would be like a burn. And so it was internal burn and you did not want to put uh, fluids into a person's intestine. And he couldn't quite believe that was true. So he did something that I still don't understand and, and I don't know how anyone has the nerve to ask people to do this, but he went to Thailand in the middle of a cholera outbreak and he talked cholera patients into swallowing a small steel ball with a long tube on it and it went down their esophagus through their stomach into their small intestine. And when he got to the right place, he would take a syringe on the tube, which would pull the mucosa from the intestine into a hole in that ball. And then he had an automatic knife that actually took a biopsy. And then he would pull this out through the stomach and, the, uh, and these people are so sick. And yet he talked him into doing this. What did he find? He found that the mucosa was normal. And that's what led to people asking, how do we get fluid and electrolytes across a normal mucosa? That's what led to oral rehydration. When people found out it was the right balance of sodium and glucose that allowed that to happen. So that's a great story that I did not put in. The last story I have in the book is my favorite. And I'll tell it very quickly that uh, the last phase of the entire budget process, after you've put in the budget from CDC to the Public Health Service to the department, each time they take things out, and then it finally goes to the White House, to OMB, and they take things out, and then they send it back down. And when it gets back down to the Public Health Service, you're given one chance to come in and make an appeal. It's called the appeal process, for things that are so important, you have to get it back in. So I got the notice that my appeal process would be on a Monday. We were gone over the weekend. We got back Sunday night, found someone had entered our house. And by the time you get your, the police out and all of this, it was long after midnight. I had to get on the early bird to go up there. I was not feeling good. I get to the public health service only to be told when we meet with the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Agency heads will not be allowed to speak. But why are we here? In case the secretary has a question of you. In, but instead, the budget people will present your appeals. So we go in to Secretary Richard Schweiker, who had been senator from Pennsylvania, and the first agency is NIH. And sure enough, the head of NIH never said a word. CDC was next. And two of the budget people cannot get a number to come together. And as they're arguing what the numbers should be, Richard Schweiker, he looks bemused, and he said, you know, Bill is sitting right here. We could ask him. <laughs> and then without saying anything else, he turned to me and said, would you present the appeals for CDC? I presented the first two in, a, I hope, a business-like way. The third one was OMB taking money away from immunization. Well, vaccines, that's the foundation of public health. And so I said to the secretary, you know, I was burglarized this weekend, and I can forgive that burglar, but to have OMB steal health from the American public and no one has the courage to stand up to them, this bothers me. He turned to his budget people and said, give them all three appeals. And then he turned back to me. He said, did you have any idea it would be that easy? <laughs> I said, no. He said, because now I'm curious, what's the fourth thing you would have asked for? Wow. 
I said, the fourth thing would have been my first thing, but I was told I could not use it. And he said, what's that? And I told him that we were seeking money to build a class four laboratory for the agents that are deadly and we don't have a vaccine or a treatment. And I said, the way it is now, we can only deal with one agent at a time. We have some 80 agents in that category. And this was shortly after someone had put poison in Tylenol in drugstores. So I said, if we had a Tylenol virologic problem in this country, it would take less than an hour for the public to know there's no way we can handle it. It takes us two days to clean up the lab and go in with new unknowns. He turned to his budget people and he said, we have to at least try. He called me at home at night a week later and he was like a school child. He was euphoric. He said, I'm at the White House. I've just gone head to head with David Stockman, the head of OMB. And he said, you're gonna get your lab and because you scared me, you're not gonna have to wait till next year. We're gonna put it in this year's budget and you'll never even have to defend it. And that's why we have that lab at CDC. So a few years later when it was dedicated and Jim Mason was the head of CDC, I got an invitation to the, uh, to the uh, ceremony and I heard all these people talk about the great things of what this lab can do and how it came about and so forth. And I said to myself, no one in this room knows we actually owe that lab to two bungling budget people and one unknown burglar in Atlanta. Thank you. Microphone set up on either side here uh, for people to ask questions, really broad ranging questions, I think, of their interest uh, in the topics he's covered in his talk, in the history of global health, or the topics covered in his book, uh, or, or other things that you uh, think he could provide uh, light in the times where sometimes the light is hard to find. So uh, please step forward, uh, particularly welcoming of students to come forward, uh, which I think was the interest we had originally for this session. So uh, go ahead and line up.